Hello, and welcome to Waterfront Alliance's final Climate Week webinar entitled An Island Without Water, Understanding the Inequities to Accessing the Waterfront. Our panelists today will discuss the current inequities in access to usable waterfronts, how environmental justice communities carry this burden, and the severe limitations of underdeveloped waterfronts that provide little communal benefits and are at significant risk due to climate hazards. My name is Farhana Husseini, and I am the Director of Programs and Climate Initiatives at Waterfront Alliance. For Climate Week, the Waterfront Alliance centered critical climate resilience issues facing New York City through a series of webinars, roundtable discussions, art exhibits, boat tours, and coastal cleanups. We welcome you to visit our website to learn more about the events that we had uh, and to learn more about our partners events that are coming up. Uh, before we begin, just a little bit about the Waterfront Alliance. The Waterfront Alliance began as a project of the Municipal Art Society of New York. Uh, it became an independent organization in 2007 when a group of leading activists, businesses, foundations, and civic organizations came together with the goal of making the New York and New Jersey Harbor a shared and resilient and accessible resource for all. For more than a decade of leading the charge in how the New York metropolitan region views and uses its harbor, and with more than 1,000 alliance partners, such as Bronx River Alliance, Harlem River Working Group, South Bronx Unite, City Island Rising, and many more who are committed to bringing real change to our region's 700 plus miles of coastline. In 2019, the Waterfront Alliance, along with many of these partners, stepped into a new and critical leadership role to define New York Harbor's response to sea level rise and coastal storms. Our crucial long-term focus on increasing waterfront accessibility for all, along with our efforts to advocate for a working waterfront that is a vital source of business activity, well-paying jobs, and educating the next generation of waterfront stewards, continue as essential pillars of our work to create a well-adapted and resilient New York Harbor. And now I am truly honored and humbled to introduce the following panelists. Arif Ola is the executive director of South Bronx Unite, which brings together neighborhood residents, community organizations, academic institutions, and allies to improve and protect the social, environmental, and economic future of Mott Haven and Port Morris. Arif is a social and environmental justice advocate, grassroots urban planner, and community activist with more than 20 years of experience in designing and managing community development programs, establishing diverse alliances, and co-creating campaign strategies around local, state, and national issues. Ben Regas is a community organizer at Waterfront Alliance, and as a lead member of the Climate Informed Communities Program, he works alongside our program staff and partners to strengthen community climate and disaster preparedness, as well as community engagement in long-term climate resiliency projects. Daniel Reynolds is the Director of Programs and Operations at Bronx River Alliance, which serves as a coordinated voice for the river and works in harmonious partnership to protect, improve, and restore the Bronx River corridor so that it can be, an, uh, so it can be a healthy ecological, recreational, educational, and economic resource for the communities through which the river flows. Daniel joined the first Boogie Up the Bronx River Ride uh, about eight years ago and has been involved with the Bronx River Alliance as a volunteer since then. Daniel also serves as a board member with the Bronx Council of Environmental Quality. John Doyle is the president of City Island Rising whose mission is to strengthen the social and cultural fabric of our diverse community by promoting civic engagement, preserving the historic and nautical character of City Island and its environment, protecting the, the remaining open space, enforcing traffic control, increasing municipal safety, and supporting small businesses. John Doyle is a lifelong Bronx Bronxite who was born in Pelham Bay and has lived in City Island for over 30 years. 
John has been involved in campaigns to inspire political change and social justice. I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for being here today and for sharing all of your insights with us. We are really honored to have you. As we begin, uh, this first question will be for everyone. Um, I would love for us to understand a little bit more about what it means to have access to the waterfronts. Um, and Arif, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Farhana, for, for that uh, introduction. And I'm really happy to be here uh, with uh, Ben, Daniel, John, and you um, for this important discussion. And uh, welcome to all of the uh, participants um, hoping for a good discussion. So what does access mean? Uh, I, let me paint a picture, first of all, of what uh, we're looking at in the South Bronx, particularly Mott Haven and Port Morris. Uh, we have uh, what we call environmental racism. Um, and let me define that. What, what does that look like? Um, it, it, for us, it means a heavy concentration of polluting facilities in a very small area. Uh, so in one small area of the South Bronx, Mott Haven, Port Morris, we have four power plants. We've got a fresh direct warehouse. We've got a FedEx warehouse. We've got several other last mile warehouses. We've got the Cross Bronx Expressway. We've got um, the Bruckner. We've got the Major Deegan. Um, and we've got several waste transfer facilities all in one area. And that has resulted, uh, and by the way, that area um, is on the waterfront. So that's the connection here. Um, and uh, that area also is New York State Department of Transportation land. So our public land is essentially being used to poison us. Um, and what I mean by that is all of these polluting facilities have created uh, a toxic uh, mess in the air, which has resulted in a range of illnesses from asthma uh, to cognitive impairment, to heart disease, to dementia. So from the cradle to the grave, a person's um, entire life is impacted by exposure to air pollution. Um, and in our case, all of these polluting facilities are on the waterfront. And while these polluting facilities are on the waterfront, on public land, we have zero access to the waterfront. So when we talk about um, equitable access, what we mean is, number one, actually having access um, and safe access points. Um, there is one um, section which is accessible. Um, however, you know, that's debatable and questionable because you have to contend with a steady stream of garbage trucks heading in and out of the waste management facility um, to reach that small section of the waterfront, uh, which we're trying to act activate actually with uh, Waterfront Alliance's partnership. Uh, so we do not have equitable access to the waterfront. We don't, we don't have uh, we basically any access to the waterfront. Uh, and what we want to be able to do is really make sure that people in our community know, first of all, that there is a waterfront. You know, sadly, um, we're living on a peninsula and many people don't even know that because it's entirely inaccessible. Um, and then um, to create access, safe access points to the waterfront um, and have open green space uh, that people can, uh, can travel to safely. And so we have a waterfront plan that is um, envisioned by the community. Uh, and uh, we have architectural uh, drawings for it. Uh, and it would serve the purpose of uh, creating access uh, also to create coastal resilience and um, to mitigate um, some of the air pollution that I just uh, described. With that, I'll stop and um, you know, turn it over to anyone else who wants to chime in. And that, that was really helpful, Arif. I think you set the stage really well. Um, ben, would love for, for you to, to share your thoughts. Sure. Um, yeah, firstly, just want to echo what Arif said. Thank you, Farhana, for the introductions. Um, and thank you to all the participants that are here. Um, you know, it really means a lot to us. Um, and yeah, I can talk about it kind of in, in a bit of a more general way, I think, from the Waterfront Alliance approach and, and also my thoughts. Um, I think when we think of access, um, we really need to be thinking about real community public space. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, kind of like what Arif was talking about there, 
are there are neighborhoods in the city that have no access to the waterfront. And there are also, you know, maybe parks or little areas in some communities that are technically waterfront access or maybe a bit of a promenade, but aren't really real community space. Um, and so when we are thinking of, you know, waterfront access, um, we want, you know, areas that are uh, maintained, that have amenities, um, that have diverse uses, that are actually designed for um, various, you know, types of recreation, um, and that also have direct water access. So just being able to see the water or maybe even go up to it a little bit, um, that's not really prioritization of waterfront access for a community, um, which has, you know, public health benefits, um, you know, just a, a, a increase in green space, um, and since access has historically been, you know, segregated, a lot of waterfront access is very coveted, um, and obtaining it is, is difficult. Um, and with water-based recreational activities, it's the same thing, you know, with a lot of these, these you know, kayaking or, or something that, that has, there have been a lot of barriers to access to those sort of activities, um, by communities for years. Um, but something that I have come across a lot in my work with the Alliance is a kind of growing fear of water. Um, and that's kind of how climate change comes into this conversation where um, people, you know, maybe used to really covet waterfront access and, and are now um, maybe scared of what that entails for them in their communities or their home. Um, and so even if, you know, I could snap my fingers and make, you know, ev every resident of New York City have equal access to the waterfront and maybe water-based recreation, um, it now has to be climate resilient for that access to really be sustainable and really useful. Um, and so I think that that kind of puts us as advocates for waterfront access in kind of a interesting position um, where we really have to think about those issues as being, you know, one in the same. Um, but as everyone who lives in New York City knows, you know, that's not stopping developers from putting luxury apartment buildings on every waterfront that they can. Um, and so people clearly still want to live on the water, you know, regardless of these issues. And so we want to make sure that this isn't contributing to a cycle of displacement where, you know, people may feel forced out of their waterfront community that they've historically been living in. Um, and then that's taken, you know, luxury housing with climate resilient infrastructure there to make it possible. Um, and I'm also kind of curious, you know, to think more about this fear um, that's growing and, and maybe how that can be assuaged and what's the role of access in kind of recreating people's relationship to water as a whole. Um, and now I'll, I'll pass along to one of the other panelists. Thanks, Ben. John, do you, uh, do you wanna chime in? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Bohana. Um, You know, I, I, I kind of echo a lot of what's been said here in the sense of that there, and I particularly appreciate what Ben just said about developers kind of coming in and kind of capitalizing on public spaces, because as we all know, promises are made during construction that don't kind of come through in actuality after construction stops. And, you know, they, it's not uncommon for them to seize land that's not theirs and then to kind of foreclose access to it thereafter. And that's something I think we need to be careful about. And also I would say, um, you know, in terms of barriers, having enforcement of existing agreements is very hard. Uh, I'll use an example on City Island, uh, on Bound Street, uh, by not residences, but on the other side of Bound Street near some commercial uh, uh, seafood restaurants, they were supposed to maintain a waterfront area. This was something they agreed to do in order to get their zoning uh, variances they needed. Now that area, it doesn't exist. And who enforces that? Who is able to come in and say, you promised this to the community, there would be some level of public access. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, a hot potato, if you will, in terms of jurisdictions. Is it the community board? Is it the borough president's office? Is it the buildings department? Is it the uh, department of city planning? Could, is it all these things? And who's going to step up to make sure that as that development's going on, that they live up to the promises they made that community? Otherwise, there's not going to be trust in, in future development that we all know does need to happen. I appreciate you raising the, the development issue and highlighting it. Um, Daniel? Yeah, I 
I agree with everything that's already been said. And, you know, just given, given the industries that have come up in New York City, it's, it's always surprising to remember and hear that, you know, people used to come to New York City for the oysters, for the like eating out of the rivers. And with industries, you know, industries, you know, commonly would be built up along the waterfronts. And we, you know, continued that practice without thought unless there were communities with power and influence that kept those waterfronts. It's always good to notice which communities have access to a waterfront or have a waterfront view and which ones don't. Um, and, you know, there's uh, uh, our headquarters that I'm sitting in for the Bronx River Alliance is in Starlight Park, which is crossed like by the Cross Bronx. So, you know, there's uh, there's been a lot that's been done to combat the institutional racism that had the Bronx River not be known to communities that, you know, had, to, you know, people would dump into it. Um, and and there's also, yeah, like if you're not aware of water, the culture of, you know, fear, if you're not familiar with water, uh, you're, you're, you might also be fearing it. But, you know, to what it means to have access. So we, we host public paddling programs for people who have never paddled, never been on the water. We take people out who don't know how to swim and, and it's amazing. And you get to really connect with nature. You see the urban part of it on the Bronx river. You see the natural part of it. Um, and, and I think it really like having access to a waterfront opens up that connection to nature that a lot of um, our systems and development has paved over. Um, and there's also actual accessibility to the waterfront. So like, do you have stairs down to the water or can you have an accessible route down there? Um, how close is it to public transit? And with Starlight Park, is there signage so that people know it actually exists? This is really great. I, I, I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, one of the things, Daniel, that you and Arif have sort of highlighted is this sort of um, this historical inequitable uh, access to the waterfront. Um, Arif would love for you to share a little bit more about how this inequity, you've already highlighted it, um, but would love for you to share a little bit more about how, how this inequity continues today. Sure, um, thank you, Farhana. Uh, just, just as some background, uh, the inequities that we are seeing today, whether it's in the South Bronx or in some other communities, many other communities, it's, it's really, um, sort of a legacy of um, racist um, policies uh, of the past, you know, redlining being one of the more notable ones. Um, but since then, um, discriminatory policies that have um, resulted in the disinvestment of communities like the South Bronx. Um, and it's no coincidence that uh, our communities have this um, sort of concentration of polluting facilities, lack of resources, lack of access to the water. So, I mean, I think, you know, since the Bloomberg administration, New York City has seen a waterfront renaissance, right? Um, and, um, you know, we have you know, communities that have, you know, more than, um, you know, uh, one uh, waterfront park. I mean, I'm just thinking about Little Island, right? Um, it, it, and of course, a lot of that is private money um, that that created in um, Little Island. But um, where are our uh, waterfront um, um, green spaces? Where Where is our waterfront access? Um, and so, sort of the the, the historical um, references um, and um, sort of, uh, the history of it can't can't be neglected and can't be ignored um, to really understand um, the the current situation. So, you know, that begs the question: well, What are we doing about it right now? What are we do doing to address um, these types of injustices and inequities? Um, and you know, what's sad is that. I think, whereas in some cases, maybe there is some progress being made uh, in communities like ours, um, in, in many cases, that's not the case. So I'm thinking about the U.S. Army Corps' um, HATS proposal, which many of you um, in um, you know, uh, participants um, may be aware of, but just as background, um, the Army Corps was tasked um, with um, creating a, a plan uh, to protect New York City and beyond um, the area. Uh, uh, from coastal um, storms and sea level rise. Uh, they came up with their, with several um, sort of draft um, proposals um, several months ago. Uh, and uh, that uh, 
basically has shown us that um, they really did not do their homework when it um, comes to communities like ours, uh, where uh, instead of um, creating access um, to the water to address the wrongs and injustices and equities that we've been talking about, um, in, in, in some cases, and, and I'll just talk about Mont Haven Port Morris, um, they've sort of uh, proposed a plan that would permanently sever uh, us from the waterfront. Uh, what I mean by that is for Mott Haven Port Morris, they're proposing an on-land seawall, an on-land seawall. Um, and, um, you know, we'll, I'll refrain from the wisdom of just these types of um, structures um, for the moment, but um, the, the, the way that that perpetuates injustices and, and, and inequities can't be denied. Um, and I don't think we can let them off the hook by um, saying that, well, you know, there was so much that they needed to um, do, um, so much um, they needed to consider. Well, one of those things they needed to consider was talking to our community, um, especially given that it is a community that has experienced so many injustices um, and inequities over the years. Um, and it is also, not coincidentally, a low income community um, and a community that's primarily um, black and brown. Uh, and so, I think that you know uh, coalitions like Rise to Resilience um, uh, are critical um, to be able to speak in a voice that um, you know where we have solidarity among our communities and organizations, and we can point out, well, you're actually just perpetuating injustices, um, and we have a, a louder voice. We just, you know, unfortunately, you know, it's sad that we continue to be placed in this position of expending our resources and time um, to to respond. Um, to these types of um, continuing um, plans that, um, you know, again, um, do a wrong by our community. Uh, so I'll stop there and, uh, you know, hand it over to anyone else who wants to take it. I'll, uh, I'll open it to the floor. Go ahead, John. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no, I, I totally agree with what Arif said in terms of the Army Corps' plan being inadequate, and it seemed to have a, more of a focus on Manhattan, as opposed to the outer boroughs, which were just kind of left to fend for themselves. Uh, I, one thing I just, as, as a lot of people were talking here that I thought about was just, you know, when you close off access to the waterfront for regular people, you know, that creates a vacuum of power. And very often that vacuum of power is, uh, is seized on by corporations and corporate interests. And I think that's really what Arif was getting at, that they closed off access in South Bronx and as a result, corporate interests took over. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of pollution going on. I will say uh, on and kind of in East Chester Bay in the larger uh, waterfront area here, you know, we've had Rodman's Neck, which is the NYPD firing facility, which obviously you've had lead, you know, concerns and issues of lead and other environmental concerns. They detonate stuff here frequently. Those are environmental concerns we have. I would say the city and the state have not been entirely transparent about that. We have the old uh, Pelham Bay landfill which has been a source of concern in the community for some time. People forget they used to actually fish off of City Island not too long ago. And in the 90s, when they had a lawsuit against the firing range at Rodman's Neck to shut it down, the Fishermen's Union hopped on that lawsuit because it was vital for their jobs and for their members' interests. That fishing doesn't take place really largely off City Island and in the Bay now. You have to go farther out. and. Uh, Save the Sound does their their water quality uh, readings every year. And the water quality around us is rated an F. And so I just keep in mind that when you close off these things and regular people can't access the waterfront, you know, sometimes that serves interests that aren't always visible and transparent to see. And as the people are kind of foreclosed in their opportunities, uh, corporate interests step in and that usually leads to pollution and uh, things along that nature. If I can just add to what John said, I, you know, that that is um, in, in entirely true of the South Bronx, Mount Haven, Port Morris. We have seven luxury high rises that are going up on the waterfront. Um, 1,350 units will be coming, um, will become, um, uh, you know, open to um, mostly um, affluent individuals. And, you know, we won't get into a conversation about um, area median income and affordability. Um, the other point I, I, I want to make is that you know, when you when you sever people um, from natural environments, right? Um, I mean, personally, um, you know, I think that there's a, a spiritual bankruptcy that that creates, um, and um, and also um, I think we can all agree that um, being connected with nature, Mother Earth, um, really um, serves us in in many ways, not just our 
um, physical health, breathing fresh air, but also our, our our mental health, and you know, if you believe in it, spiritual health. Um, and so uh, we understand uh, a connection to Mother Earth, to the water, to um, green spaces as ones which are very very connected to our health because our health and the health of the natural environment are inextricably linked. Yeah, um, it's all across the Bronx, you know, being a part of the Bronx Council for Environmental Quality, I, I hear about along the Harlem River that connects down to, you know, Port Morris and um, there's the Tibbetts Creek that's being, you know, daylit. And so like, in terms of historical inequity, like we've literally paved over streams and brooks. Um, Marshall Parkway used to be a brook. Um, and it, 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 the industry just makes the water quality even worse, you know, going to the point John made about like being able to fish. There are people who fish along the Bronx River. We tell them not to. And, you know, it's just a part of life. It's a part of a culture that um, is not at this moment safe in most waterways in New York City. Um, you know, you want to look at access to the Hutchinson or the Westchester Creek. Um, other, you know, they're, they're covered by highways most of the time. Um, you can barely see the Hutchinson River. You know where the Hutchinson River Parkway is. Um, and, you know, the, the inequity continues just because the, the land use was defined a certain way. Um, it was treated a certain way. It was polluted and it was dumped in. Yes, there are standards. Yes, the water is cleaner than it used to be 10, 20 years ago. Um, however, it's still zoned a certain way and that access does not exist. And the planning and development, as we've been hearing from folks, does not exist to, you know, have equitable waterfront access. I know a new path was opened up for access in the South Bronx and, it's not even, you know, it's not part of like a connected greenway. It's a little bit hidden. So if you want to talk about equity, I think you also have to talk about access, um, advertising it, um, and, and making it welcoming. Um, I'll just jump in at the end. I think um, everyone covered, you know, much of what, what, what I would add, but I think something that I've uh, been thinking about a lot and um, that I've heard from some of the communities I work in is also kind of inequity in post-disaster recovery. Um, and so, for example, when Hurricane Sandy happened um, and a lot of, you know, waterfront communities were partially or almost fully destroyed, um, in the process of building back, we saw a lot of inequity in where money went. Um, and part of that, I think, is that, you know, New York City is a city of renters, um, primarily. Um, and renters don't often get the choice about, you know, what's going to happen to housing that they were living in once it's been uninhabitable. Um, and uh, a lot of times these kind of state or federal programs are very geared towards homeowners. Um, and so with the Build Back Better program that happened after Sandy, there was a lot of um, issue in kind of accessing those funds and, and, and much of it went to the white communities that were affected. Um, but a lot of immigrant communities, you know, didn't even know about the program. There was very little outreach. Um, and also a lot of the land that had been, you know, destroyed was then taken for luxury development after. Um, and so like in Red Hook, there's a, a really, you know, that's a good example of a neighborhood that was affected in that way. Um, and so I think that's, I just bring that up to say that, you know, even if you have waterfront communities that have historically had good access to the water and the waterfront, um, it's not always permanent. And, and often um, for communities that are, you know, more marginalized, that sort of um, relationship can actually be more temporary. Um, and so I think with climate change as it exacerbates and we see more, you know, disasters like that happening, um, we really need to make sure that those sort of responses are really in line um, with actual community building and with, you know, discouraging displacement. Um, so I just wanted to add that at the end. That's really great, Ben. And, and I really, again, appreciate the responses that are, are being shared here. Um, ben, would love to actually turn to you uh, to tell us a little bit more about what what this means by disaster and, and sort of the extreme weather that we're beginning to sort of face now. Um, so 
thinking about sort of sea level rise, other, you know, climate hazards that you also just mentioned, um, you mentioned how it can impact communities, uh, but can you can you share a little bit more about particularly communities living near parcels of, of coastal land? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I can actually take that question a little bit um, from a different angle. So I, um, you know, have more of a community engagement background than a climate science background. Um, and so as I've been working with the Alliance, um, that has been kind of the approach that I've taken, um, which is just to say that I think there are issues that I, I didn't really have quite on my, you know, the forefront of my mind about how sea level rise will affect us um, and, and affect waterfront communities kind of on the daily. Um, and so I think in the news and, and kind of in the general, you know, public public knowledge, when we think about sea level rise and its effects, we think of greater intensity of storms, of, you know, greater storm surge. Um, but actually there's, you know, for a lot of coastal communities, um, we will see unless, unless there's, you know, climate resilient infrastructure put in place, kind of sunny day flooding, um, meaning that even on the days where it's not raining or there's not a storm, just the tides um, will start, you know, encroaching on land. Um, and this is a problem, you know, of course, for residential communities that are um, on the water, um, people that have been living in those areas for years. Um, but also for our infrastructure, and actually I'm gonna shout out Arif here because um, at the at South Parks Unites uh, Climate Week event earlier this week, um, you know, we toured some of the the, the different um, facilities on the water in the South Bronx, and it's a demonstration of the infrastructure that we have um, actually right on the water's edge, you know, so there's con ed facilities, um, there's, you know, um, waste treatment facilities um, all along the water that are very vulnerable. Um, and so it's not even just like a residential issue, but it's really a citywide problem. Um, and it goes to show that when we deprioritize certain neighborhoods um, and, you know, make it one community's problem, um, it's a disaster for everyone. Um, and so I think that's that's something to consider. But then, of course, yes, you know, in in um, when we look at what the effects of climate change that we're seeing now, um, we will be seeing greater storm surge, greater intensity of storms um, that will have a disproportionate effect on coastal communities. Um, and then also, this is you know a, a little bit um, related, but extreme heat is actually the largest killer. Um, of, of any climate stressor in, in the country, um, but also in the region. Um, and I think often when people think about coastal communities, they don't think necessarily about heat, right? Because you think, oh, you're by the water, you're cooler. But if you think about New York City and how actually a lot of us are very close to the water and do not feel any sort of cooling effects from that, um, people are really vulnerable to the heat waves that we're seeing now. Um, and so that's something that I think cannot be understated, even though it's not necessarily related to sea level rise happening in and of itself. Um, so I think that's kind of, um, you know, uh, where I would go with that question. Um, but I'm, I'd love to pass it on to anyone else who wants to add on. Yeah, I, I, I just to weigh in on that a little bit, Ben, thank you so much for bringing up the, um, extreme heat and uh, the urban heat island effect. Uh, we did a study a couple of summers ago with uh, Columbia University's Millman School of Public Health on the urban heat island effect um, in um, Mount Haven, Port Morris. And not surprisingly, you know, the temperature uh, is higher um, on, you know, already dangerously hot days. And so um, I, w the thing that um, makes uh, the situation in the South Bronx um, difficult is that it's what we call cumulative impacts, right? It's not just one thing. It's it's the urban heat island effect. It's the lack of access um, to the waterfront. It's lack of access to resources. It's the disproportionate pollution burden. It's the um, lack of support to, to the local schools. So all of these things, I think, as we talk about the waterfront, um, and again, thank you, Ben, for raising urban heat island effect, um, we can't look at these things in silos. Um, and we really have to look at how all of these things combine to um, to really produce some really, really gross injustices.
Thank you, Arif. Daniel, please go ahead. Um, yeah, and I know Arif already touched on uh, on hacks and that, you know, looks at coastal stormwater, coastal sea level rise. We're also looking at, you know, flooding from water that comes down the Bronx River, comes down other, other tributaries and rivers. Um, and these multiple impacts, you know, the we've seen in other areas of the United States, you know, the, the ground is so dry that when the rain does come, it, it can't even absorb it. So we, we do experience that here as well. Um, these multiple, you know, climate hazards really kind of add up and pile on each other. We um, have to, you know, talking about, you know, we have weather events, we're going to have, uh, you know, a lot of rain we're gonna have over an inch of rain is predicted for this weekend which means we can't only not only can we not run our paddling because it's raining we can't run it for a day or two afterwards because of the combined sewage overflow um so the way that we've built our systems isn't necessarily resilient and doesn't um doesn't you know lend itself to people wanting to be near the water you know we can create equitable access and then we still you know then we have to also create education so that folks don't get in the water a day or two or three after the, the storm water. And sometimes, you know, systems don't work right. And the, the storm water or the untreated water ends up mixing and ends up in places you don't want it um, if it if it backs up and comes out of out of uh, a drain. So there's there's a lot more that we're going to we really need to prepare for and invest in. I agree with what's been said, but also some of the solutions are also uh, integrated as well, as Daniel was saying. Like, for example, in um, City Island, people have come over here. They come over the bridge, seaport to the Bronx, get the wind blowing and everything else. But when you come right over for many years, you had and you still have, you know, uh, an unmapped city street area that was somewhat private as well, a mix of the two. And it sits there just in a state of decay. And, you know, if that area and, and you know, I, I know we're going to get to this in a little bit. What are the biggest challenges? But sometimes the biggest challenge is the city of New York and that, you know, agencies aren't proactive. They're not, you know, again, infrastructure is expensive. We all know this. An acquisition of certain private sites is, is complicated. And those things take so much time that you lose, you know, activism interest, you lose community engagement. And what I would say is that particularly for that piece of land that I was talking about over by the bridge, you know, how that's redeveloped, uh, if it's developed into a park, if it's developed into an area that allows for like kayak launches, things like that nature, could also incorporate better resiliency so that some of the homes nearby that now are on kind of uh, stilts, if you will, we're well, not stilts, but kind of a, a basement that's a more just a kind of wall, you know, a unfinished basement that, uh, you know, we could do more to make the parkland more resilient that could protect those homes. So it's about sometimes creating uh, opportunities for uh, you know everybody to win. It, now, not everything in life is a, a zero sum game. Sometimes we can find ways for everybody to win. And sometimes it's how we market those things and how we speak about those things in communities that not only it's gonna be a waterfront area, but we're gonna do things that are gonna make it to protect your home. And I think we need to find ways to talk about that to bring over people who otherwise might be a little bit more skeptical. Thank you. I, I think one of the things, John, that, that you've said and that Ben have said um, is this idea of infrastructure. Um, and, you know, I think in addition to the lack of access to water, there's also an uneven investment in infrastructure to prepare for these climate hazards that uh, that all of you are sort of sharing. Um, and I totally agree, Arif, that it is, it should, you know, there should be multiple infrastructures, right, that, that are that are dealing with all of all of the cumulative impacts that I think you 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 highlighted, um, and we see this large infrastructure that's being built uh, around the FIDI Seaport, around Battery Park City, et cetera, um, and these are being developed to not only improve access to the waterfronts but also to ensure that the communities that are living you know around the waterfronts are also protected um, by uh, by sea level rise, by coastal flooding, and even by the, you know, the heat, the urban heat island effect. Um, but this infrastructure is not being built in the same way across all neighborhoods. Um, would love to get your thoughts on, on why does this uneven investment in infrastructure exist? 
Um, John, would love to start with you. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I think, you know, primarily, uh, you know, a, a, and you raise a great point in the financial district in Southern Manhattan, you're talking about a very dense piece of property where everybody kind of, kind of has a shared collective interest. And when you get out, particularly to my area in the East Bronx, it's a lot more low density and there's lots of competing interests. And there's not the same level of engagement and stakeholders or consensus in some cases uh, that you see there. And, I, you know, lower Manhattan, again, it's the financial industry. You've got business and residents kind of speaking with one united voice that things uh, that these areas need to be protected. And you don't always get that in uh, you know, certain outskirts of, of the city overall. You know, the more removed you are from Manhattan, it seems also the attention to you is also removed from Manhattan, I would say. Um, and, you know, again, it's about getting the key stakeholders, the commissioners, the the uh, the commissioners, as well as other uh, people from City Hall, uh, city council members out to those areas so they can understand what's going on. And, and you know, those are sometimes uh, multi hour trips that need to be sandwiched into committee hearings or other things going on in those council members districts. if It's not their district. So uh, those are barriers as well. And uh, as been touched on before. Uh, you know, the, the outer boroughs, the Bronx in particular, has suffered from a lack of investment for many, many years. And so we do see that in terms of the infrastructure and the acquisition now. Uh, you know, some projects there's been interest on for 10 years and they have trouble getting, you know, we talked about the unmapped city street and my, and my last comments. Uh, you know, they've been trying to get a response to that for 10 years from the Department of Transportation. And it's it you know there's no um, no one's lighting a fire under some of these uh, agencies to do anything, and that that presents a problem as well. As we all know in, in bureaucracies, it sometimes it's easier to do nothing than to do something, and sometimes the inertia becomes a, a you know culture, in a, in a lot of those areas where it's just easier to do nothing. Let's let's focus. Yeah, you know, I know that the mayor likes to say a city of yes, but we do sometimes in some of these agencies still have a culture of no. And uh, we need to kind of realize that balance and uh, find ways to, as I said earlier, create multiple winners, whether it's the homeowners who live there or the renters who live nearby some of these properties, uh, you know, a greater, greater emphasis on certain economic opportunities that can exist in certain areas. Uh, I know in particularly the, the unmapped city street, there's some talk about having, you know, some level of, uh, of uh, a concessionaire contract, uh, you know, to have like a small restaurant in there. You know, that that could be helpful. And, you know, sometimes what we try to do is uh, have people realize, you know, that to seize on, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very rare, uh, even though we all probably have it, it it's rare opportunity to be able to craft a public space. And if people don't take advantage of those opportunities, it's not uncommon for the city to lease it out to a corporate well-connected interest or a private interest who's given to the right political uh, leaders. And it's about seizing that opportunity. But as, er, as I said earlier, if you struggle from a culture of no and bureaucratic inertia, it's very sometimes hard to get the city to pay attention to those things. Uh, and as we also said earlier, infrastructure is expensive. I mean, we have, uh, you know, not any of our lifetimes, but 100 years ago, you know, there was a ferry that was going to City Island and you could exit from Belden Point Pier. Uh, and that pier, which is now next to Johnny's and Tony's for any of the seafood lovers, and we encourage you to come to City Island, uh, that pier has been destroyed for my entire lifetime. And, you know, there really hasn't been an emphasis to try to get that pier rebuilt. And so a few years ago, we had to lobby for a park, uh, pocket park near there. It used to just be a chain link fence at the end of the island. So it was kind of like your visit to a uh, your visit to Alcatraz as well as your visit to City Island. Uh, and now, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful viewing station. But it's a viewing station with a view of a very, very dilapidated pier. And we've got to address that as well. And I, I think, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going a little long here, but we were talking earlier about infrastructure, also monitoring that infrastructure and making sure that the infrastructure serves the purpose for which it was intended. Uh, there was recently a condo development on uh, Fordham Street called On the Sound Condominiums. Uh, there was an article about it in the New York Times in 2014, 2015. It's a nice development, brought a lot of new people to the neighborhood, uh, you know, welcomed. Uh, but they were supposed to do a public waterfront accessible area. And they did do a an area on the waterfront 
but it, it's kind of turned Fordham Street into Fort Sumter. Like there's all these, and I think Daniel's seen it, there's all these like rocks and walls there and you really need to get on your tippy toes to see the water. So yes, there was a public park created next to the waterfront, but they built a fort between the waterfront and the public park. So the, the benefits thereof, and, and uh, you know, you can't really insult the developer when they went through all the different city planning processes and was signed off on. And there was no real community input at that time. And I think there would have been, and I'm speaking, you know, hypothetically here, but I think there would have been an interest in making sure whatever was built near the waterfront had waterfront accessible views. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Arif, Ben, Daniel, would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I, you know, I, my mind um, goes to, um, yes, I completely agree with, uh, with, with John in terms of, um, you know, what does uh, Lower Manhattan represent, right? It's, it's, um, it's a financial center of uh, the city, um, if not the country. Um, having said that, um, let's look at the Hunts Point uh, Food Distribution Center. Um, in the South Bronx. Um, this is possibly the world's largest food distribution center, definitely the country's, right? And yet it remains vulnerable um, to flooding and um, sea level rise. Um, let's look at the infrastructure that is in Mount Haven, Port Morris. Um, I talked about the waste transfer station. One of, just one of those waste transfer stations processes the household waste of the entire Bronx and other waste. That's vital city infrastructure. And that's lying there. Um, unprotected. Uh, there are power plants there. All of these things we don't want, of course, but the fact is that they're there, but they are there unprotected, right? Um, and what happens um, if uh, there is uh, flooding, um, serious flooding um, to that? Just take, for example, the waste management uh, facility, the waste transfer station that processes the household waste of the of the South Bronx. Well, that trash just, just stays there, right? And, and, and um, you know, on hot summer days, the community is already exposed to um, an awful stench and, you know, waste management, to their credit, you know, they try hard. Um, we're not against waste management. I mean, we don't blame them for setting up there. You know, they were um, incentivized to and they got space to do it. Uh, we blame the state for leasing that land to a private um, company. But this is vital infrastructure. So why is this vital infrastructure not prioritized? And we can't help but think the location um, and the historical context of, um, you know, neighborhoods like ours are a main reason for that. Yeah. Um, you know, history continues, history repeats itself. And, um, you know, I know Voter turnout is low in the Bronx. Um, trust is low. You know, when I know I've, I've spoken to folks, well, why don't you, you know, go to this meeting and let them know what you think? And, you know, some people will, and a lot of people won't. Um, political power, um, historically and currently, you know, if you have the time and money to take care of your life and go to community meetings or make donations or be the squeaky wheel, that's more, you know, more power that comes to a project or a community. Um, and yeah, I, I think folks have already said most of that already. And I'll say priorities are reflected in budgets. And if it's not in a, con you know, in a committed budget, it's not a priority. Um, I, yeah, I'll just add on to the, at the end. I know we're we have, uh, running short on time, but I think um, you know, in your question, you stated that um, it's, it's not only, you know, the, the resilience projects that are being done are not only to protect against climate hazards, but they're also to increase access, right? And, you know, I was at the Resilience Plus Expo um, yesterday that was put on by EDC, and it looks incredible. I mean, like the plans that they're developing have taken years to design. Um, they're thinking about redoing the entire freeway. Like there is a lot of thought and money going into that project. Um, and that's because they don't want it to just be a wall, right? Like everyone hates a wall. They don't want that. Um, and it could even be, you know, great for tourism. There's so many benefits to public access as we've been talking about. Um, but I don't believe, just like Arif said, right? I don't believe that at the distribution center in Hunts Point, they're going to put the same amount of effort into designing something that's beneficial for access um, for the community 
even if they are going to put something in to protect us against climate hazards. Like that's that's really the crux of this problem, right? Like the 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 design, you know, is going to be five years long at this point that they're working on this, and it's great that they are, and it's it really shows priorities, you know. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Ben. Thank you all. This is really uh, really insightful. Um, I'm gonna just uh, move really quickly because we do have a few questions in the in the uh, from the audience. Um, but uh, but would love to as we sort of end this segment of the uh, the webinar, uh, would love to hear your recommendations uh, for the audience on sort of how to take action and what we can do as individuals to strongly ad to strongly advocate for the development of resilient and accessible infrastructure. Um, Daniel, would love to actually start with you. Thank you, thank you. and thank you for this panel. Um, and you know, with with equity in mind, you know, budgets reflect priorities. You know, there's money at the city, the state, the federal level. Um, organize, talk to your people, and ask for the funding and the commitments over and over and over. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Arif will touch on some other ways to advocate around, you know, hacks and, and the resiliency. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, I think, um, in addition to that, uh, just, uh, get informed, get in touch with organizations like ours, frontline organizations that are, that are doing the work and, and ask us, how can we help? Um, and you know, be good allies and, and be in solidarity with us. And so um, right now we are um, working with a larger coalition to respond to the US Army Corps HATS proposal um, and more people who are um, speaking um, out uh, against some of these uh, unjust elements of the plan, the better. We need more nature-based solutions. We, mean, we need more green infrastructure, um, not hard infrastructure and, and other sort of lacking parts of the Army Corps plan. There is a, um, a, a New York State voter approved uh, four point two billion dollar bond act um, that is going to make um, a lot of money available um, to communities for um, a variety of environmental projects. But we need the um, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to hear from you uh, about um, ideas, and those ideas um, if, uh, should be the ones that uh, you know frontline communities, um, groups like ours, are putting forward. Um, and so, again, get in touch with us about that one one last thing i'll say is you know uh, we're uh, as we we think about access for us it's it's not just about you know getting that access but it's also about making sure that those um the 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 the, the infrastructure that's built um the 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 green space that's built the waterfront plans that are built are also um, the usage of those um, spaces are determined by the community so we um, operate under the the model of community land trust and community land trusts are ones that really uh, facilitate and, and prioritize and center um, self-determination. So we don't want to just have access. We want to be able to own um, those spaces, especially when it's public land. Um, and so that's another way you can get involved. The New York City Council has in front of it what's called the Community Land Act. And that Community Land Act would prioritize um, among other things, when New York City disposes of public land, that land trusts and nonprofits would be um, would get a first right of refusal, which means that they would um, be given um, the opportunity to respond first um, as um, opposed to real estate um, developers. Right now, every year, most of our public land is, is essentially um, given to private real estate developers. Um, so in short, public land for public good, get, in, get involved by getting in touch with organization like, organizations like ours. Thank you. Um, I can just jump on in the end. I think it's funny for me to now bring this up because I have talked a lot about infrastructure, but um, a big chunk of my work at the Alliance is on, um, you know, emergency preparedness while infrastructure is not here, um, but we're still facing these different climate stressors. Um, and so I think um, just just in, in that sense, there are resources that are available. Um, I really recommend, you know, anyone, um, any of the participants that are part of a community-based organization or work with the community um, to, you know, sign up for Notify NYC, um, which, which um, you know, is an alert system for extreme weather, um, also to discuss emergency preparedness and climate change, kind of climate education. 
um, with your membership and even reach out to the Office of Emergency Management. They do trainings. Um, they do, they, you know, they provide free resources um, to learn about these things. Um, so that's another, just another um, resource that we have. Uh, I would just try, there's been a, I'm writing down a lot of the stuff that other panelists are saying because it's very wise. Um, I would say, you know, it, it's kind of a three pronged stool here, you know, be in, be informed, be engaged and be persistent. And what we find at is for a lot of the resources that are out there, a lot of the listening sessions, it's not always well, uh, well, it's well publicized, but also it tends to fall on certain days that are, you know, uh, election day or the summertime or around the Christmas holiday when these public comments are, are done. So, you know, stay informed. And I would say you can always put stuff out there into the community. Social media obviously is a tool for both good and for evil. Try to use it for good. Make sure your neighbors are aware of what's going on. And, you know, if you, if there's a public comment period and you can type up a few sentences as to what you'd like to see and you send it to a bunch of your neighbors, You'd be surprised how many neighbors, if you ask them to take two minutes of their time to shoot an email or to write someone, they'll do it. Uh, being being engaged, uh, a lot of these agencies, they're not used to actually getting a phone call from someone who's involved in the community and say, hey, you know, you're doing this. I have concerns or I'd like to see this or whatever. So being engaged, don't be fearful to pick up the phone or write that email to a particular agency. Uh, obviously, being in consultation with your elected officials is enormously helpful. Because sometimes you can put things on their radar that might not, they might not either one know that or two, it might not be a priority for them. And then just be persistent. There's nothing wrong with following up every month on an email. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, if you're not getting a few responses to call that person after a while, uh, you know, just keep at it because you'd be surprised how many of these things people assume are uh, goners or never going to happen. And then all of a sudden money can come through and the whole situation can change overnight. And particularly when we have the bipartisan infrastructure deal, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is basically a climate bill and a healthcare bill, uh, the Green Bond Initiative, which uh, Forhana and I were at a, a panel on or a discussion on a few months ago. You know, there's gonna be a lot of money coming into to, uh, both the state and hopefully to the city. And the store, you know, as someone said earlier, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but also the, the, the cases that are made now are going to determine where that funding flows later. And it's on incumbent on all of us, uh, you know, particularly those of us involved in Bronx-based organizations to speak up because as Arif and others have alluded to, you know, Southern Manhattan and the financial interests, you know, they can hire the consultants, they can hire the people who make the glossy flyers, they can hire the folks who, who do a lot of that. It's going to be on us to, you know, through this group and through other groups have an organized fashion, have a united fashion, and make sure that money is spent uh, in an equitable way and in a way that does the most amount of good for the most amount of people. Thank you everyone for, for such great insights. Um, we do have several questions that have come through. Um, I, hopefully we have time for one or two. Uh, I'll just take the, the first one here. Um, what are one or two things that take your work together or separately to change or expand trajectory? Is it policy? Is it funding, capacity building, grant writing, CSO fixes, something else? Um, I can just pose it to anyone and feel free to, to jump in. I think capacity building. I think the, the both, you know, both, both staffing wise and, you know, movement wise and membership, you know, the more folks who are engaged, the more folks who can reach out to elected officials, agencies, and, you know, the squeaky wheel gets, uh, gets the grease. Great. Um, and we'll just take one more question. Unfortunately, we are almost, well, we are out of time. Um, but uh, but the last question is uh, any good examples on how to call on the city agencies who are waterfront landlords to be accountable for access infrastructure and access enforcement, specific ways to bring EDC, DCAS, SBS, DOT closer to access goals as the geography as the geographically uh, responsible agencies. Uh, 
anyone can take it. I, I you, think Jeff. it's a great question. Uh, I wish I had a great answer for the question. I think the, I think what Maggie, oh, what Margaret's talking about, and I think, I know Margaret, uh, is that there is no center place within the city government right now at like a deputy mayor level who can go into all these different city agencies, the agency she just listed, DCAS, which owns a lot of these properties, the EDC, and really, and, and really bring them together and corral them in a place that is outcome driven. That's, that's the problem we have right now. Everybody's looking at it through their own silo and their own parochial interests. And you know, for a lot of these people, doing nothing is the easiest way of going forward. And you need somebody at a city hall level, frankly, to come down and really uh, shake these agencies up and get them all on the same page. And unfortunately, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, again, I, I have nothing but respect for our elected officials, but a lot of the local elected officials we deal with are at the legislative level, at any level of government. I'm not picking on any particular level. And they can they can make suggestions for allocations of funding and a budget, but they can't compel the city agencies to give anything more than lip service or state agencies to give anything more than lip service. And we really, I, I, and Margaret touches on a great point with that question, there needs to, and, and this group can maybe be helpful with this, we need somebody at a, at a high, high level of deputy mayor status who can go into these agencies and force compliance because what usually winds up happening is during climate week, a lot of these agencies will come out and say this is a part of their agenda or their five-year or 10-year plan, and then they don't act on it for the other four years, 364 days of the year. You don't hear about that, that thing on their plan ever again. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Arif, Daniel, Ben, would you like to share any more insights? No, I, I, I agree with uh, what, what John shared um, and um, really have nothing else to add to it. Yeah, I agree. I'll, I'll just echo what was said. I hope someone can find something optimistic to say because I'd feel horrible if we left off on that, you know, <laughs> terrible, uh, terribly not optimistic tone. I think these are all really important insights um, for us to be sharing and leaving with the audience, but I think it's also important that our audience knows that there are ways that they can take action and they can push, you know, our elected officials to, to move forward on, on certain areas. So I just wanted to say, you know, Arif, Ben, Daniel, John, thank you so much uh, for taking the time today and, and for being with us and, and to our audience for engaging in this important conversation, particularly around the intersections of equity, access to waterfronts, and climate resilience. Uh, we deeply appreciate all of you being here and for the audience choosing to spend your time with us, um, and, uh, and we hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone.